How do we even find these viruses? Um, well, in a case where you would have a potential outbreak or you're recognizing that there is a viral outbreak, um, we would look at, uh, you know, what are the potential serum or what could be collected from individuals that have this infection. And from there, it can be grown on whatever the tissue is, the human tissue, where it's a suspected of being uh, suspected of expanding. And once we have the genetic material that can be sequenced and then matched against databases to try to isolate and identify what exactly is that virus and to also then be used for how potential vaccines could be generated against it. So w this one, which, which came out of Wuhan in, in China, uh, it was something that had some similarities to other viruses, SARS type viruses, but it had its own unique traits too? Um, well, the best way to think of viruses is that there's a potential for exchanges of genetic material to be happening all the time. In this case, coronaviruses can be infecting in animals just as they are in humans. And there is a potential for a jump that can occur where you have a virus that has the potential to infect not only a, an animal, but also to be uh, transmissible between humans as well. So you have that co-infection potential that's available. And as a result, then you have this uh, ability for, for a new virus to start uh, to start expanding within a human population. And it was Canadian researchers who were able to first isolate that virus. So how important was that step in order to, you know, start this research? Oh, it's critical. I mean, that that is a critical piece of it because we have to know what we're dealing with first. And you can't really design a vaccine against something that you don't know what it is. So as, as granular that understanding as possible, that all goes towards the, the efficacy and, of course, safety pieces that would come into the generation of a new vaccine. And it seems like we found it pretty fast. You know, we can give Canada a pat on the back for this one. Uh, absolutely. And I mean, I actually, I think about this on a global level. I mean, this really is a, a global collaboration that's at work here. And to see, I mean, not to take away from the grimness of what's happening with COVID-19, but from a scientific perspective, what you're seeing happening here is this is a, a rich moment for science where you see scientists really stepping up to, uh, to, to do their best and to collaborate as necessary to get this done. And when it comes to vaccines, Roderick, I know you're doing incredible work with the potential of a nasal spray. Yes. Yeah, so the nasal spray, I mean, has a few potential advantages and not to say it's a perfect system in, in and of itself, but it is a way to try to mimic the infection. What we're trying to do is to get as close to what a normal infection would look like through SARS-CoV-2 and to follow that same pathway, but doing it with very, very safe components and how we sort of mimic that procedure so that we can generate the most pertinent and maximal immune response that would be protective for individuals. So what's the difference between bacteria, germs, and a virus? Um, well, I mean, if you call them germs, I mean, <laughs> germs could be just about anything, I guess, you know, anything. But we, we tend to give that, that term to something that's, you know, has a, it's pathogenic. So, you know, it could generate sickness in, in humans. Um, bacteria, not all of them do that. Some bacteria are good or they're commensal and do really nothing. Um, but a virus, again, it's, a, it's microscopic and it has the potential as a parasite to be able to grow in our cells and to obviously cause, cause sickness and disease the same way some bacteria, of course, could as well. The difference between them is that we could look at a bacteria as actually an organism. A virus is not really an organism. It would be kind of a genetic entity that can kind of hijack the cells of whatever its host is and propagate its own, its own genetic material and, and, and often cases cause disease. So it, it actually gets into your cell and, and alters it. Yes, it gets into your cell. Um, it often, uh, it has to be expressed in one way or another. That doesn't necessarily mean in your nucleus. It depends on what the genetic material is. Um, and it really just takes your cell, turns it into a factory to really mass produce its own, its own genetic material and its own products so that it becomes a factory for more of the viruses to be produced.